Well, welcome this morning. I hope you guys have been having a great uh, focus series so far. And our, you know, as you know, our content here is chaos in order. And so today, in this session, I'll be talking about from Kronos to Thanos, finding order in the chaos of mythology. So I don't know how many of you are here because you're excited about ancient Greek philosophy and ancient Greek mythology and Kronos and the Titans and Olympians. And how many of you are here because you're Marvel comic fans and excited for a little bit about Thanos? Jeff Bilbro, huge Marvel comics fan. <laughs> excited that you all are here. So I'd like to begin by asking a question of what are some of our favorite stories? Because I believe stories are something, kind of an artifact within our culture that we often take for granted. We don't often think about the power of stories. So what are, what are some of our favorite stories that we're, we're familiar with? Favorite stories. Richard, what's your favorite story? One of your. My favorite story is, I don't know, but I really enjoy it. Fairy tales, yeah. Yeah, all right. Great, thank you. Snow White in the back. Old Man in the Sea, that's a great story. Up here, Anna. Okay, yeah, underdog stories. There is uh, something about stories, often they convey implicit values and ideas that we're drawn to, right? And I think it's kind of part of the human condition in the sense that we are drawn towards stories, especially good stories. Um, and I believe stories, and I'm going to argue this in a, a kind of more robust way in a minute, but stories have a very formative effect on us as individuals. And it's often something we take for granted. So a question I want you to consider as we work through this talk of if stories affect us, how might we use them to find order within a pretty chaotic world, okay? So think about that question. If stories affect us, how might we use stories to find order within a chaotic world? So one quote I want to share with you, this comes from Jamie Smith. He's a, philosopher prof a philosophy professor in Cal at Calvin College, just down the road from us. And he argues that we are narrative animals at the very existence, right? Our very, I'm sorry, let me say that again. We are narrative animals whose very orientation to the world is shaped by stories. And this is what I mean by stories have a way of shaping us. There's something that happens almost precognitively that we don't even know is transpiring, right? We consume a story, and then all of a sudden we begin to consider and think, hey, how is this reflected in my life, you know? Um, thinking about David and Goliath, right, the underdog, uh, and what, what Goliaths are there that I'm facing, or... Um, Thing, things along that nature. And I think, honestly, stories kind of give us kind of building blocks, kind of foundational elements to how we find ourselves in the world. They kind of orient us to this. Um, so, for example, I really enjoy outdoors and adventuring, right? I teach an intro to backpacking class at this, at, here at Spring Arbor during the spring semester. And it's a great opportunity. But how did I buy into the story of adventuring. Probably there's a lot of different things, right? And probably environment plays into this. But I recall as a young kid, right? Six, seven years old, I was a camper at a camp called Northern Frontier Camp in upstate New York. And it's deep in the woods. You have to go down a three mile forest road, dirt, tr dirt road to get to just to the base of camp. Now this camp back in, you know, the early nineties and even long before this had this great heritage of this program called Hardcore. And it was these guys that just had to do a ton of just challenging things over the course of two weeks. So the hardcore guys, they would do things like have 10-mile trail runs. They would do things like treading water in an, for an hour in the lake. And um, it, it was kind of their experience was culminated by having to spend a 24-hour period, you know, on camp property, but by themselves with one tarp, one match, one Bible and an apple. 
you know, and imagine the story that kind of goes along in the six-year-old mind that these guys were hardcore. And every year I was up at camp, they were always there, and it was kind of like the end of their experience. Now, the thing was, these guys were 16, 17 years old, pretty scrawny, probably like patchy facial hair. But as a six-year-old, I thought they were the coolest. Now, the hardcore program was actually uh, canceled because uh, the state of New York decided it could no longer insure it, right? Because it was just kind of too dangerous and too intense. That's probably the mentality of federal regulations between the 70s and the 90s and 2000s, right? But there is something about my six-year-old self that bought into the story of hardcore and what it meant to be a man in the outdoors, right? And I was never really critically narrated, you know, I never really critically rationalize this narrative of hardcore, but it's just something I consumed and eventually that formed me. And again, you know, probably just keep going to this camp and eventually I work there and uh, I never got to do the hardcore program, but it's something that stuck with me, with me. I oriented myself to the world in a way that responded right to this hardcore story. Another quote I want to share with you is from Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue. And maybe you've seen this um, or are familiar with it, but it's, I cannot answer the question what I ought to do unless I first answer the question of what story am I a part of, okay? I can't answer the question what I ought to do unless I've already answered the question of which stories I'm a part of. Stories have a way of motivating our behavior as a way of um, motivating the way we act, right? Um, or even, too, it has a way of impacting a, a particular ethic of ours. Think about you all being part of the story of Spring Arbor University, right? There's a particular ethic that goes along the lines of we're a community of learners, right? the whole concept, we're part of that. And that has a way of forming you, either positively or negatively. You might find yourself being part of the Spring Arbor community and saying like, ah, this story I really don't jive with. And so you may veer off of that, be like, yeah, I'm not all about the liberal arts or I'm not all about community. Or you might really resonate with it and find yourself being drawn further and further into the story, the narrative that goes around Spring Arbor University. And I think too, having the concept starting off with we are a community of learners. Community is a very big piece of what we do here at Spring Arbor. Or think even more, think about the story of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. This also has a way of forming us as we find ourselves identifying with, you know, if we find ourselves part of the Christian story, the Christian ethic, we're going to begin to model our behavior in a particular way. We'll begin to answer that question, what must I do? You know, we'll begin to embody what Paul calls us to do in Colossians 3, right? Take off the old self, put on the new self, becoming more and more in the likeness of Christ. It's because we're identifying with that story of being part of the Christian story, we begin to change into Christ likeness. So stories and narratives, they have a way of shaping and forming us. So let's jump back a couple hundred years, the Hesiod's Theogony. And this is a poem came out um, by the poet Hesiod around 8th century. And uh, it's an origin of the gods, origin of humanity. Um, and I argue it's pretty full of chaos, even if you just look at this artistic representation of it. Um, it's, it's full of chaos. And lo and behold, the first character we find in this is chaos, okay? So chaos is kind of represented by this dark abyss, right? And I'm not necessarily a Greek scholar. There's probably more that could parse this out a lot more articulately than I could. But here's kind of the gist of what happens. So you have chaos, dark abyss. Then you have kind of this first generation of the gods, these people, these entities, Gaia, which is Earth, um, this guy who's the underworld, Uranus, which is the sky, and Eros, right, which is desire, and um, Gaia and Uranus, they procreate, and they have this kind of sec second generation of people, the Titans, and then there's also the Cyclopses that they procreate, and then these other 
um, individuals. There's these three brothers that have like 100 arms and 50 heads, right? So, so there's a lot of like weird genetic things going on. But you have what's most importantly, the Titans. And the leader of the Titans is Kronos. He's you know, kind of the most powerful, the most interesting one of these. But what's crazy, what begins to happen is like these weird family dynamics and just continued on chaos. So much so that Kronos, um, at one point Gaia, hides all her children in herself because, is anybody familiar with this story? She hides all her children in herself, gives Kronos a sickle because Uranus is going to come and murder his children. What does Kronos do? He cuts off Uranus' genitals and drops them into the sea. It was a real ballsy move on Kronos' part, right? <laughs> and, but it's total chaos within Greek mythology. You go to the third generation, and you have um, Kronos and his sister Rey, and they birthed the Olympians, right? And Kronos, it was uh, prophesied that one of the his children would be his downfall and kind of remove him from power. So what does he do? He eats all his children. But his wife, being wise enough, actually slipped him a rock in lieu of Zeus. You know, so Zeus wasn't eaten by Kronos. Kronos ate a rock. How he didn't know it wasn't a kid, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, Zeus survives. And then when he grows up to be full maturation, he disguises himself as a cupbearer poisons Kronos, and then Kronos vomits up all his, his siblings, Zeus's siblings, right? Then Zeus and siblings go to the Cyclopses, and they get weapons, and they wage this 10-year war on um, the Titans. And again, there you have Greek mythology, probably a crass interpretation of it, okay? But that's what happens. And then all of a sudden, you have this mass flow chart of uh, everything happening with chaos, and how everybody was birthed and whatnot, and all this kind of horrible incestual relationships and whatnot. But that's the beginning of the world, purely chaotic. Is there an opportunity where we might find order within Greek philosophy, within this Greek mythology? Now, arguably, it's not just an origin story, but there is this implicit theme, right? Wickedness is punished and virtues are rewarded. Wickedness is punished and virtues are rewarded. And even the gods aren't above this principle. We find this repeated numerous times where a god could have a, you know, a fundamental flaw and that throws them off um, or they're um, you know, punished for something like that. So I, th I believe what I'd like to argue here is that order within mythology is found within virtuous characteristics. Okay, it's virtue that holds chaos at bay, right? Virtue is what holds chaos at bay within this mythology. So fast forward another 300, 350 years or so, and we have um, a philosopher, Aristotle, who writes his, Nicoma his Nicomachean Ethics, right? So this is Virtue Ethics 101. Eth virtue becomes this huge piece just for how the Greeks lived within their society and how they operated and understood what it meant to live the good life and what it meant to um, kind of flourish as humanity. So Aristotle begins in arguing that life is teleological in nature, right? One of us as, as individuals, humans who reason, we look towards the end, okay? We look towards an end and he calls this our telos. Right? And we all have a telos. But what tying this back to McIntyre's idea, right, we all have a story we identify with. This would kind of be comparable to Aristotle's no notion of telos because there is a story we're buying into. Now, for the telos for Aristotle, um, it all kind of culminates in this understanding of human happiness. He calls it eudaimonia. Okay, or human flourishing. And this is where the virtuous life is supposed to bring us. And in the sense, we all have an understanding of what eudaimonia means, right? What human happiness, um, what story we are caught up with within that. For instance, one we often take for granted or don't think much about is maybe just the story of the American way of life. There's a narrative that we've been consuming um, at, 
for a long time of just like, hey, as somebody part of the American way of life, this is what you do. You know, you, you work through, you get educated, you pursue these opportunities, you try and find a stable job, you try and get a good car, blah, you know, a stable house, this stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with the American way of life. I'm not saying that whatsoever, but buying into that story forms us in a particular way. When we think about what do I need to do to acquire the elements that, um, what do I need to do to acquire the pieces of the story of the American way of life, we begin operating in a way that will make sure we meet those goals. So we might pursue an education at a four-year school in South Central Michigan in order to then pursue, you know, this American way of life. Stories have a way of forming our habits and routines. I want to make a key point here, though. Right? For Aristotle, his idea of human flourishing, his eudaimonia, it had to be a depiction of human flourishing for everybody, right? It couldn't just be for a particular group, particular ethnicity, particular race, particular subgroup. Eudaimonia had to be a story that encompassed something for everybody, something of transcendence. Um, so Aristotle continues in the sense that virtuous behavior is what then enables us to flourish, okay? And we could define this as a character trait or disposition that is good for oneself, but also for the community. Um, so yeah, there we have. Virtue that is good for oneself, that is also good for the community. So Aristotle then uh, begins to delve into virtues and what that means. And he often would argue that virtue is the mean between a vice's excess or deficiency. He called this the golden mean. So for instance, courage would be the mean between, or that balance between cowardice and foolhardi foolhardiness, okay? Example in this story, I'm sorry, example, let me give you a story. Last summer, Matt Hill, you guys all know Matt Hill, he and I were swimming at Lime Lake. We come out of Lime Lake only to find there's a young guy there um, who is clearly inebriated and hitting his girlfriend, his woman. So it was like kind of this loud, and he's cursing loudly, and like Tom Kunselman was there. We all love Tom, right? And Tom like actually just intervened with this guy, and Tom was off swimming, and then this guy started hitting this girl again. And all of a sudden, it's this, you know, domestic abuse, but also public disturbance. We're like, what are we going to do? So we could have, you know, to argue the balance of this virtue here, right? Being brave. We could have been, um, we could have just walked away. Could have been easy to just hop in our car and pull out of there. But that wouldn't have been the right thing to do because here is this, you know, woman who was getting hit. We could have just like jumped into the fray and tackled this guy and uh, perhaps gotten stabbed. That wouldn't have benefited either of us um, or would have de-escalated the situation. So thankfully, Matt and his, uh, cool-headedness just walked up there and it right Matt's a big guy like he's he's pretty intimidating he had his hands up in the air kind of like a big old grizzly bear and then like he just we were able to de-escalate the situation and I think that's what kind of a representation and I should say Matt de-escalated the situation I was just like oh man what's going on I've never been <laughs> I've never been punched in the face before this might happen you know <laughs> so it thankfully it all worked out but it's because right Matt is a virtuous person and he's able to practice that golden mean of bravery, right? He wasn't foolhardy, we didn't walk away from it. So together, we were able to de-escalate that situation, everybody was okay, um, the cops came and whatnot, but everything worked out. So Aristotle provides us a whole list of virtues, right? And how we wanna strive for finding the balance between these virtues. Um, and not working in the vice of their deficiency or the vice of being excess, right? I talked about being cowardly versus rash and brave. Um, what about generous, right? Somebody with a lot of wealth could be really extravagant in their wealth and spend it all. And we might say, oh, this person's generous, but that'd be also very foolish. Or that person could be very stingy, right? So you want to find that, that 
that happy medium there where things are are balanced. Sorry, I'm just going to flip my notes here. So Aristotle argues that we need to live into the golden mean, right? And what I argued first is that virtue, virtuous character, is what holds character um, holds chaos at bay. So let's take a look at a uh, a war among another gods. Okay, we have the Marvel universes a poster from Infinity Wars. Has everybody seen that? Anybody not seen it? There's going to be some spoilers, just so you know. I hope you came into that knowing. Um, so here you have the Marvel Universe, and similar, you know, in most mythology, Marvel begins kind of, this Marvel Universe kind of begins with this, um, with chaos. There is these six singularities of existence that after the Big Bang were kind of crushed into these, you know, compressed into these stones after the universe began, right? And they were dispersed throughout the cosmos. So a lot of the adventuring within the Marvel Universe is about key characters going about the cosmos, collecting them, and trying to keep the evil guys away from it and protecting it. Um, but each stone, right, kind of represents this uh, key element of human existence. And um, we see how these elements, you know, just kind of create chaos within the lives of the characters, right? Because they're all seeking it, possessing it, and at times they're destroyed by it, or there's other people destroying them for it. So, enter the notorious villain, Thanos, boo. You know, and I, I, I appreciate this comic of Thanos here, the strip where he's like, supremacy can't be imprisoned. My divinity is absolute. You know, what, what kind of um, uh, vicious kind of character, you know, kind of portrayal is that? And Captain America is just like, yours is a false godhood titan and all false gods eventually fail right here. And so it's this big power struggle. Now you'll look... Um, there on Thanos' left hand is the Infinity Gauntlet. It's kind of hard to see in that, but it's kind of shining. And that compri is comprised of all six stones. And it's Thanos, right? Now, this guy is one of Marvel's most notorious villains. Um, and he seeks control of the universe. And the Infinity Gauntlet is going, is what is going to get him control, Right? And for him, his good life, his eudaimonia per se, is uh, kind of universal domination when the world is balanced. And he seeks it upon himself to balance the world through his infinity gauntlet. Um, but right, if you recall, Aristotle's notions of eudaimonia was human flourishing for all people. You know, Thanos would argue his version is human flourishing for just select people. And as you know, within Infinity War, uh, we're unsure how it's going to continue, but there's the snapshot at the end where Thanos wiped out half of the population and including a lot of our heroes um, whom, whom we dearly appreciate. And so his virtues, right? There are clearly a lack of virtues, clearly a lack of vision of the good life, and clearly a life out of balance as he is kind of bringing chaos to the cosmos. Ooh. So enter our um, Marvel heroes. How can we find order in the chaos that is the Marvel Universe? Well, thankfully, we have people like Tony Stark slash Iron Man. Um, and I actually, I believe this is actually Jeff Bilbro's favorite superhero, Iron Man. Um, and so, right, the narrative of Iron Man, Tony Stark, is that he, he's kind of a complex character, right? He has a lot of money, a lot of technology, and a lot of kind of charisma. People follow him. But his life very well, some of his characteristics are often out of balance, right? He's full of arrogance, arrogance to a fault. You know, arrogance to where his confidence and his abilities have been destructive to himself or his team, or the people he loves surrounding him, right? And then he's often very rash. 
So at times, when we see the narrative of chaos kind of progressing within the Marvel Universe, right, it's because Tony Stark is out of balance. And it's only when he kind of resolves himself to be honest with himself and kind of goes back to this kind of truthfulness um, to kind of, you know, um, confront his own hubris, confront his own pride, is where we see that virtue within Tony Stark kind of bringing a balance and then being able to kind of draw the team together and get themselves out of the scrape. So, Tony Stark. Another character we all enjoy is the Hulk, right? Also, Bruce Banner. And I think the Hulk is just a very fascinating character. There's something very primal about him. Um, in the sense where the flip side, Bruce Banner is pretty meek and mild, right? Um, so the character trait that is often in excess, going out of control, right, is this rage and anger within the Hulk. If you watch all those uh, Marvel movies, how many cities has the Hulk destroyed, right? Quite a few. Um, and even in the sense, too, there's Bruce Banner has a vice. Bruce Banner, the kind of that alter ego of the Hulk, he has a vice. Um, and it's kind of self-pity, you know, or self-fear. There's often a lot of those movies where he doesn't want the Hulk to come out because he's just like, I, don't, I can't control it. But eventually what we find, eventually when the Hulk kind of starts hitting its stride, is when there's this understanding of self-moderation, right? Um, being able to moderate behavior and um, remaining in control, self-regulation. And so there we see how the, the virtue of self-regulation helps Bruce Banner and the Hulk you know, find themselves, get out of scrapes, and destroy other things aside from cities of innocent people. Finally, how about Peter Quill from Guardians of the Galaxy? Uh, this is, I think, Peter Quill is one of, one of my favorites. And, you know, just because there's, um, I, I think, a lot of very human tendencies within Quill that I appreciate. But, right near the end of Infinity Wars, we see Peter Quill face-to-face -face with Thanos and the whole team, the whole Avengers crew. They're about to pull the Infinity Gauntlet off of Thanos' hand. And then Quill, who's overcome with emotion because his girlfriend Gamora is missing and he believes Thanos has killed her, just loses it and then compromises the whole mission, right? You guys remember that? And so what happens is that the excess, it's the excess of Quill's love and loyalty to Gamora compromised everything. And so, again, it goes back to Quill is a very loving and loyal person. And I think that's one of the, my favorite traits about him, where it's reflected in a lot of the films and how he relates to his team. And often it's in a very sarcastic way. But it's still there nonetheless. And it's only when that loyalty and love is in balance that they're able to overcome their opposing, opposing forces. So we'll see how things continue to progress. I don't know any spoilers for the next movie, but I do believe that what we'll find if we're seeking um, order within the Marvel cinema, right, that it's virtue and virtuous characteristics, virtuous behavior, is what holds chaos at bay and inevitably helps people move forward in defeating foes like Thanos. So you might say, like, I'm not a superhero. What can I do, right? How can we cons be consumers of stories to help us reorient ourselves in a way? Um, how can we be consumers of stories to reorient ourselves in such a way to live virtuous lives? All right. Um, and right, we may not be, we're most likely not battling uh, Greek gods or the fate of the cosmos probably is not in our hands, but we do face chaos, right? We face chaos and maybe that's, you know, our own version of family dysfunction. Um, perhaps that's something of, you know, our own inner addictions, our own obsessive compulsive behavior, um, our own health, you know, our own anxiety. There's things that disorient ourselves um, in our day-to-day our -day kind of being in the world existence. And vices have a way of kind of bringing out our worst, right? Which then affects other people. And then sometimes in the context of community or family, our vices kind of could flare up the vices of other people. 
So we need to strive to live into the virtuous life. So thankfully, a lot of wisdom, you know, from Aristotle to Augustine, Aquinas, they've given us an understanding of how we can acquire virtues, um, how we can move forward. So two things. We learn and acquire virtue through imitation, okay? Through imitation. And this largely goes back. You need to be critical of what stories do you consume? Because we need better teachers, better moral exemplars of people who demonstrate virtuous character. And this could be, you know, a mentor figure within your own life. Maybe it's a parent or a faculty member or a friend or um, it could be an author. I've been grateful for, you know, the writings of people like Thomas Merton or Augustine, people that have, you know, long since passed away, whose books still demonstrate to me what it means to grow in virtuous character and more significantly, significantly growing in the Christian walk. But there's also, we have a ton of access to other moral exemplars. You know, think of somebody like Brene Brown. You could follow her on Twitter. You could read her books. You could watch her TED Talks. You know, somebody who isn't necessarily in Christian circles, but demonstrates a very great story of what it means to be within the world and live a virtuous life. We have access to them. And so we need to begin to habituate ourselves by imitating them. And again, we want to be imitating people that demonstrate a worldview, a eudaimonia that is good for all human flourishing. You know, so be critical of that within the stories. Second, we learn and acquire virtue through practice. Our character traits are built on habituation. We can't just, you know, like the superheroes, we can't just put on a suit of armor and then that's it. We have to begin to habituate ourselves time and time again, you know, working in those situations that, hey, maybe we are more angry uh, because of a particular environment we're in. But as we're in those environments and we work on self-regulating, we habituate ourselves to be, you know, balanced. Um, the reason Matt and I didn't tackle that guy at Lime Lake was, one, I was scared, and two, Matt was very self-regulated. He was very calm and collected. The hay was already in the barn, so to say, uh, because he already knew how he was going to respond to that. Um, and so that's where habituation comes in. And the other thing I want to mention when it comes to practice, that Aristotle looked at our lives as a whole picture. You know, I understand we find ourselves in sometimes very challenging environments where it's hard to find balance. The undergrad, your four years of an undergraduate degree, very challenging to find balance, right? When you're perhaps juggling academic um, expectations family expectations that may be just down the road or hours away, maybe expectations for a job, right? Sometimes it's hard to find that balance within um, our day-to-day -day experience. But I appreciate about Aristotle, he looked at the whole picture. You know, so when you look at your life, how are you growing from point A to B in the long span of it? And I, arguably, if we take the big picture approach, yeah, we're going to be seen growing in virtues, developing those. Um, and I think, too, this is what is reflected within the New Testament of what Paul kind of reminds us of, of so many things, of just that we are, you know, striving towards the end, which Christ calls us, forgetting what's behind us, right, in Philippians, um, Philippians 3 there. So, all that being said, I want to end in conclusion that what we learn from mythology, such as virtue acquisition, is a way that could help us assist order our lives in a very chaotic world. All right. Well, thanks for your time. <clears throat> That's all I have for you.